Assalamualaikum What's up guys In this video, we will cover briefly the introduction to particle physics For more information and deeper understanding on this topic Please refer to the notes available in the description box We have 6 learning objectives to be covered Eventually, this will also answer the following questions The first question is what is thermionic emission? The second is How to accelerate a particle? Next What is particle accelerator and detector? The fourth is Why do high energies required to investigate the structure of the nuclear? Next What is the standard model particle? And finally What is the relationship between particle and antiparticle? If you manage to answer all questions correctly you may proceed to the tutorials. What is thermionic emission? The word therms refer to something to do with heat and the word ionic have something to do with ionization while the words emission have something to do with emitting a product. Thermionic emission is thermally induced flow of charge carrier from a surface or over a potential energy barrier. This happens because the thermal energy given to the carrier overcomes the work function of the material. The kinetic energy of the electron increases due to the heat energy. Thus, electrons obtain enough energy to escape from the surface of the metal. In other words, thermionic emission is the release of electron from a heated metal. The rate of the thermionic emission is dependent on factors like metal surface, Temperature of the cathode and type of metal. The next wonder that we have to think about is how to accelerate a particle. A particle can be accelerated using electric field and magnetic field. Let's see how a charge behaves in a region with uniform electric field. A negative charge with certain inertial velocity is moving towards the uniform electric field. From the path taken by the moving negative charge inside the uniform electric field, we can conclude that the electrostatic force causing the charge to attract it towards positive plate. Thus, electrostatic force equals Ma. So, we have got acceleration is proportional to the electric field and inversely proportional to mass of the charge. Sx is the horizontal displacement of the charge, while Sy is the vertical component of the charge. A stationary positive charge is put inside a uniform electric field. Guess what will happen next? The charge will experience attractive force towards negatively plate and repulsive force from the positively plate. Direction of force and acceleration of the charge is in the same direction with electric field. This will also be vice versa for negatively charged. The direction of force and acceleration of the charge is in the opposite direction with electric field. As a result, the motion will always be parallel to electric field. Thus, electrostatic force equals Ma. So, we've got acceleration is proportional to electric field and inversely proportional to the mass of the charge. A positive charge is moving with certain velocity is put inside a uniform magnetic field. Guess what will happen next? The charge will experience a magnetic force. The direction of force and acceleration pointed towards the center and always in perpendicular direction with magnetic field. As a result, the motion of the charge will be in circular path. Thus, magnetic force equals Ma, where A is the centripetal acceleration. So we've got acceleration is proportional to magnetic field and velocity of the charge and also inversely proportional to mass of the charge. 
the direction of velocity always perpendicular to acceleration and magnetic field. This can be illustrated by using right hand rule. This type of linear accelerator consists of successive tubes through which the charged particles travel. The tubes are alternately connected to opposite terminals of an alternating voltage. The whole assembly must be inside an evacuate or vacuum chamber. If we consider the accelerating particle to be negatively charged electron, then initially the first drift tube is given a positive potential by the AC supply. The negative electron is accelerated into the tube. Inside each drift tube, the particle will travel at constant velocity. As the electron leaves the first drift tube, the AC supply will reverse, giving the tube a negative potential and the second tube a positive potential. The electrons are now accelerated towards the second tube. Inside the second tube, the electron travel at constant velocity. As the electron leaves the second drift tube, the AC supply will reverse again, giving the second tube a negative potential and the third tube a positive potential. The electron is accelerated towards the third drift tube. This process of acceleration between the drift tubes carries on until the electron leaves the final drift tube and heated toward the target. A cyclotron can be used to accelerate positively or negatively charged ions. Let's say you want to accelerate the negative ions. The ion is released from the ion source. The negative ion is accelerated toward D1 which is initially given a positive potential to attract the negative ions. Once inside D1, the negative ion moves at a constant speed. The uniform magnetic field is applied perpendicularly to the disk by the electromagnet. This magnetic field makes the negative ion move in a circular path. The negative ion turns around and moves toward the gap between D1 into D2. The alternating voltage reverses giving D2 a positive potential. When the negative ion crosses the gap between D1 into D2, they are accelerated towards D2 by the positive potential. Once inside D2, the negative ion has faster speed than what it was in D1. This remains constant within the disk. The sequence of events now repeated itself. The magnetic field makes the ion move in a semi-circle back into the gap between the disk at which point the alternating voltage has reversed and so the negative ion is accelerated back across the gap towards D1 which now has a positive potential once more. As the speed increases, the radius of the circular path followed by the ions increases but the time that the ions spend in each d remains constant. This means that the frequency of the alternating voltage remains constant. Generally, the charge moves with larger circular path each cycle as it is getting faster and faster. This is the synchrotron, which is one of the other examples of particle accelerator. Here is the LHC or Large Hadron Collider. LHC is by far the most powerful particle accelerator built to date. It is so big because huge forces needed to accelerate and detect the high energy. How do we differentiate various kinds of particles being detected in the detector? Here, 
We will talk about how principle of ionization and deflection were used to detect particles. Particles like proton and neutron are very small, roughly about 0.84 femtometer or 0.84 times 10 to the power of minus 15 meter. Therefore, they are very hard to be seen directly. This is why, with the help of a detector, we can identify the particle based on its strength. Ionization is gaining or losing electrons often conjunction with other chemical changes. The resulting electrically charged particle is called an ion. Charged particles are deflected by electric and magnetic field, so if these fields are applied to the particles being detected in a chamber, then the deflection helps to show the nature of the particles being detected. In a detector, the electric field and magnetic field were used in order to deflect the particles. These are some examples of detectors that have been used to detect particles. For bubble chamber, ionization principle is used to create hydrogen bubble which then turn into trails of bubbles that show the, the track of the particle. Magnetic field is maintained in order to deflect the particle of different charge. For cloud chamber, the pressure is reduced as the ionizing radiation or particles enter the chamber in order to create condensed ethanol which then turn into trails of ions in the air that show the track of the particle. Electric field is maintained between the source of the particles and the site of the chamber in order to deflect the particle of different charge. Alpha particles typically leave long straight paths. Their range in the air is determined by their kinetic energy. Sometimes, the particle collides with a particle of the gases resulting in elastic collision. In this case, the track of the two particles are determined by the law of conservation of kinetic energy and conservation of momentum. Figure shows typical tracks of alpha particles in a cloud chamber. There are alpha particles with two different energies being emitted by the source, as shown by the two different ranges displayed by the short and long lines, and an alpha particle has collided with another atom was shown by the branched track. For wire chamber, it was filled with gas at low pressure and has thousands of parallel wires in it. An incoming particle causes ionization of the gas and the electrons release drift to the nearest wire. The track of the particle is then worked out electronically. A computer processes the signals displays the results graphically. Can you guess what are the differences between all those tracks? The first path show a fast moving particles make thin curved path. The second path shows a lost kinetic energy through ionizing collisions causes more curve and thicker tracks. Third tracks show Slow massive particles make more ionization giving thicker tracks. It was shown by a proton and antiproton. And the last track show a decay into charged particle and a massive particle which then decay into two oppositely charged particles. So far, we have learned that the production of particles, specifically electrons, started with thermionic emission. Then, it was accelerated through a particle accelerator to gain energy in order to smash the target. As a result, the detector will observe the event in the form of tracks. 
This followed by the identification of the subatomic particles based on the collisions. Why do high energies require to investigate the structure of the nucleon? Imagine the electrons surrounding a nucleus as a cloud rather than a distinct orbit as they are typically shown. Of course, these electrons are negatively charged, so they have a negative field that will repel other negative things like other electrons. We need a certain energy to punch through the electron cloud. Beyond that, it becomes an issue of resolutions. When studying something by shining something on it, like light, the wavelength of the light has to be smaller than what you are studying. You may have heard of electron microscope. They are electrons rather than light because the wavelength of any light would be too large to study things as small as you want to study. Like watch with accelerators, increasing energy can be compared to making a shorter wavelength to study smaller things. Our accelerator, which operates at 4 billion electron volts, has enough energy to penetrate an atom and sometimes tear off a proton and neutron off. There are a few accelerators in the world that are much higher energy but they have to operate at a much lower rate and with what could be described as a Fourier picture. In order to investigate particles of the size of femtometer, Radiation is required with a wavelength comparable to the particle being studied. From the Broglie relation, it can be seen that the tiny radiation wavelength demands a very high energy. And secondly, many of the fundamental constituents have larger mass and require corresponding high energy for their creation and study. This can be seen from Einstein's famous equation of E equals mc squared, where E is the energy, m is the mass, and c is the speed of light. It can readily be seen that large energy is required to create a particle of large mass. This is a table of a standard model particle. It is made up of quarks, leptons, Gauge bosons, bosons. This is the summary of the standard border particles. Overall, particles can be divided into two categories, which are matter and forces. The first one is fermions, which name of the physicist named Fermi. It is made up of matter, while the other one called bosons, which made up of forces. Let's see the fermion first. So, fermion is made up of quarks and leptons. Quark is very unstable to live on its own compared to the lepton, which is more stable. Therefore, quarks have to combine in order to be stable. Particles that are acted on by the strong force are called hadrons. Hadrons can be classified by the masses into mesons and baryons. The combination of three quarks become baryons, while the combination between one quark and one anti-quark will produce mesons. However, meson causes annihilation, which is the conversion of mass into energy. Baryon, on the other hand, produce most common particles such as proton and neutrons. Proton is made up of up up down quarks while neutron is made up of up down now let's see the boson our world is made up of four fundamental forces firstly the electromagnetic wave which we familiar as photon secondly weak nuclear forces responsible for beta decay and other decays its mediating particles are the short-lived particles such as WZ bosons. Thirdly, the strong nuclear force which also called as luon. It 
whole protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus from separating because of repulsion from the electrostatic force between the protons. Lastly, the gravitational force, which also known as gravity, believed to mediate a graviton. However, graviton ha has not yet been observed. The abundance of atoms and molecules in our world is made up of mainly protons, neutrons, and electrons. In addition, the electric charge of protons eventually became plus one as the up quark has an electric charge of plus two thirds while the down quark has an electric charge of minus one third. Thus, Neutron has an electric charge of zero as it is made up of one up quark and two down quarks. Most types of particles have a corresponding antiparticle. This has the same rest mass but at least one property which is opposite to that of the particle. For example, proton has its antiproton, electron has its anti electron called positron. Neutrino has its anti-neutrino and even quarks has its own anti-quark which is up for anti-up and down for anti-down. When a particle and its anti-particle meet, in most cases they annihilate each other and their mass is converted into energy. Thank you for watching. Thanks for your patience and have a nice day. Wassalam.